Well, according to the clock, we should be talking about open rotor right now. <laughs> so, oh, okay. sorry. So let's, no, that's all right. Um, I see Jay here. Uh, the rest of us have all met. Jay, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, uh, um, I'm Jay. And then we'll go around. I know. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what much to say. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a ham. Uh, I've been doing uh, some, I got into some aerospace stuff for professional work and uh, stumbled across ORI uh, kind of through, you know, AMSAT and then ORI. And I, I'm kind of, I'm a fan of open source work. And uh, ORI seemed to be doing some good stuff in that area. So I reached out to Michelle at some point. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, I built a, as far as rotors go, I mean, I've been trying to figure out where I can fit my, my skill set in with ORI income in with um, a busy schedule. And uh, when Open Rotor popped up, I'm like, oh, maybe that's the way to help out. Um, I've built a couple rotors from scratch, rotor systems from scratch. Um, I've been using the Yezu one. So, I mean, I've got a little bit of experience with them, but I'm no expert. So, and I've done a little bit of satellite stuff, but not a lot. Uh, most of the rotors I've been doing are uh, pointing at weather balloons. So, uh, okay. I tend to be, need to go a little faster, <laughs> be a little more nimble and a little smaller than what you guys are talking to, have been talking about. So, that's it. Okay. All right. Well, I'm Steve Conklin. I'm uh, on the board for ORI and I am a, I'm a, doubly by training. I've been writing software for most of my career. And I'm a generalist in a lot of ways, um, including prototyping and things like that. And I've converted some camera systems to uh, as L rotator and built the control systems for, for that. Um, and there's obviously a need for um, Satnox covers, it has a nice little rotor design that covers very light antenna designs. But as we, as we talk about geo and lunar and uh, other missions that might be microwave uh, antennas and be a little further away, we're going to have to point some larger dishes. And so we're looking for something that will point 1.2 or even a, a 2.1 meter dish. And... Uh, and so we can talk about that later after we finish the introductions. I'll kick it over to Michelle next. Well, sure. Hi. No, I'm the co-founder and uh, current CEO of Open Research Institute. My background is information theory, uh, icky math, and forward error correction and things like that. So most of my background is going to be at baseband, uh, background in ASIC design and FPGA design, systems design, things like that. Um, and there's a need for uh, open source uh, rotor and rotator designs for all sorts of work, uh, but of, of primary interest to us is all of the amazing amateur missions. With a move to a microwave band and uh, higher orbits uh, again after uh, somewhat of a, a hiatus, then um, we really do need this. There's there are some 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 good commercial options, but they're really expensive. Um, your other options are. Uh, military industrial or uh, high-end commercial and those are really out of reach for for everybody that wants to get involved in in amateur work on the low end we had things like portable rotation uh satnox is a really good entry here but but as as steve says it's for lightweight uh devices however satnox is very much aware and and supportive of what we're doing and have asked us to please help figure out how we can add uh, microband and a slightly heavier, you know, dishes and things like that to the, to the lineup. Um, so my, my mechanical background is in automotive mainly. Uh, so I know how to grind valves and Magnaflex heads and things like that. Um, as, and, and I need to do basic machining. So, so I can help a little bit there, but I'm not a mechanical engineer. And I know that we have some challenges here that somebody with a lot more skill in mechanical design is, is going to have to fill. So that's, uh, uh, I'm here uh, primarily to, um, to get resources and to remove roadblocks and to, to you know, uh, recruit people, spread the word, uh, stuff like that. Um, you know, but in terms of the niche for, for this particular project, i I very interested in seeing what we can do. There's been a number of open source efforts in this area, and and it serves us very well to keep 
reg regular patrol and to, to go out on GitHub and GitLab and, and the community to see what people are doing because there's lots and lots of starts and runs at this problem uh, because it's it's acknowledged and, and widely perceived as a problem in the community. You know, we don't have a good solution that's accessible, affordable, and covers Leo to, to Geo at least. Um, you know, so using what's already out there and uh, leveraging it and then then putting some real leverage and backbone into it that or I can provide. Uh, that's that's my my goal here. All right. And I see Scotty is here. Hey, you want to chip in on open rotor? You know, surprise, you're hired. Um, you know. sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm here because I, I, I'm schedule challenged and can't read any schedules to figure out what's going to happen. Because this is an interesting place to hang out. And uh, I, my background is in hardware and FPGA design and embedded systems. And I'm currently VP of Tapper and uh, working on the Tangerine SDR. That's no, no mechanical background. I've used Azel rotors uh, to set up satellite systems, but they're really expensive these days, and this is a good, be a good thing. Yeah. So, in terms of the like personal weather station, what what sorts of uh, mechanical and rotor design has been discussed so far? Is this something that might help? That's a good question because there's been a lot of discussion about what kind of antennas. That we use because one of the things that we're trying to achieve is some kind of uh, consistency across the stations because we're going to have a lot of different stations connected to the internet and everybody's going to have a, a I mean hopefully everybody has the same radio now that we're building the SDR but the antennas are problematic because they're going to be different well, everybody's going to have a different one their feed line length is going to be different their type of feed line is going to be different is it directional or not? Does it even need a rotator or not? I mean, these are the questions that nobody's really answered yet because we haven't come up with a standard antenna. But if we could come up with um, some open source type of inexpensive rotor, we I doubt that we're going to need anything as big as uh, two meters, in it, like in a dish. But, and I'm not even convinced that we need directional antennas yet. That's kind of an open question that we haven't answered. And once we get hardware, it's going to have to be answered. Because ideally what we would do is we would say, <clears throat> go to DX Engineering and buy a model ABC, you know, put it on your hook and set it up. But if it's directional, uh, the cost of a rotator is going to pretty much uh, be bad news. It's going to cost as much as the rest of the system. So anyway, that, so yeah, I'm interested in this. Yeah, that's another, that brings up another point, which is that, um, we haven't ruled out here that we're looking at a family of, of rotators assemblies that we can put together. Uh, and I think the main driver for doing something at that more complex like that would be to try to break it up into cost, um, cost tiers, right? You, you, it, it's obvious just the mechanical parts to build a rotator that can swing a two meter dish are going to cost more than something that can swing a, a one meter Yagi. Uh, and so how are you going to deal with, I mean, you're going to have to deal with castings and ball bearings and um, machined parts well, that are inexpensive. Well, and, and the, the, uh, is this being recorded by the way? Yeah, it is right. Correct. Okay, good. Cause, uh, these are these are questions that are good questions that people ask a lot, and this will serve as a sort of a canonical set of answers for those. Um, the design goal here is to make this uh, not just an open design, but one that's buildable by people all over the world with a minimum of experience with with hand tools, if possible, which rules out, you know, fancy TIG welding or fancy machining where you have to line a bunch of things up, and so. Uh, the, the options we have here include specifying parts like, uh, for example, there are a lot of really inexpensive um, front wheel bearing sets for cars. You pick a popular model like a, an early Toyota or something that is available around the world, and you can find uh, yeah. a, a wheel bearing assembly for, you know, twenty under 20 bucks, two of those. They'll support thousands of pounds if needed. They have uh, 
ball bearings built into them or, or you know, uh, conical bearings that can take a lot of thrust. And so that's the sort of creative designing that we'd like to do to bring this within reach. And then once you have that, it might just be uh, a unistrut design where you you line it up and tighten the bolts. You know, well, how, about, how about you buy the uh, spindle from a Ford Pinto and a brake drum from a Ford Pinto and the bearing set, and you got something, I mean, that's a bad bottle to pick, but pick some common vehicle, and yes. you've got a big hunk of metal that costs 25 bucks for a new brake drum or 50 bucks, and it's yeah. got holes drilled in it, and you could just make the the attachment to it for the antenna. That is exactly... Yeah, that's exactly uh, the that's right. The that's sort right. of thing we're talking about. That's right. And yeah, that's, look where, that's where we but, started from. The we, we looked at like, okay, what's the most common car, and then can we Civic. can we use that uh, uh, Corolla, <laughs> yeah, right. Toyota Corolla or Toyota, Toyota, Toyota Corolla. whatever, you know. Yeah. So, what's the most common car that the engine and transmission are crappy, and you can get the wheels off of cheap? Oh, you can buy new parts for these things. New. Yeah replacement parts for cheap was i we don't have the actual research unless it's in the repo but you know what the thing um, that would be cool is especially you're talking about i mean i'm i'm this big modular fan right you want to run a little antenna you want to run a big antenna well maybe you say we don't care what model car you use i mean you have to get the bearing and the spindle and the drum to match yeah from well, the same vehicle, as, but as you know there are actually there are options that span multiple makes and manufacturers. You know, you, right. you do have parts that will cover uh, quite a few. So our, also, our first, you, uh, you know, the kind of like the first stake in the ground was, okay, well, instead of making people make it themselves um, or using something uh, commercially, uh, you know, available for that was specific as a rotator, which narrows your field by quite a bit, why don't we take advantage of something that's available globally so that anybody anywhere, the most widespread automotive parts, uh, that you buy this, that, and this, and then you may only need to build that, you know, and, and if, if you, you can bend that. it or break it or drill it, then it, it opens it up to, to like Steve said, hand tools. And, and that's where we kind of started from was to mm -hmm. something that was available to be built from commonly um, available items, you know, inexpensive available I'm items. You don't have to specify. You can just say an A spindle, A set of bearings, A wheel. No, no, we're looking for very no, for specific design. Yes. We were looking for something we can replicate in multiple yes. places. Uh, you give a recipe so that somebody that, that all they have to do is get this, that, and that, and it bolts together. Right. But my point was is that the piece that drives the rotor, you got to make that specific. But if you can make it so it will work with any old drum bearing and spindle, that really doesn't really matter because yeah, that's true. That, that there's a, probably available yes. because now yeah. anybody can go to their own junkyard, find out what they have, which right. might not be what you have. Yeah, there, there's a lot of right. crossover. So a lot of the well, patterns are, are, are common, you know. Makers so, will be able to use this as a basis for many different variants. Um, and, and then... The, another part of this is that there will, I anticipate there will be pieces that you can't just buy off the shelf that are specific to this design. And for those, we'll try to manufacture those in a way that, or, or make them manufacturable by people in the community. There are, there's a subset of any creative community, including the ham community that has 3D printers and laser cutters and welders and machines that to, to machine tools. And so will there might be a market for those and well or places like tapper that would offer kits maybe of the parts that you wouldn't normally be able to get yes. anywhere else that's yeah. exactly right and then there's there's also the option that we could pursue a commercial manufacturer and and if they can produce it it's an open design if they can produce it at a cost that that people want to buy it well more power to them but right. Either as a kit or an assembly. Yeah. So the first, I mean, the first round of reviews from the local mechanical engineers that, that looked at it, you know, after they first kind of, after they first stepped back and went, Oh, well, well, that's an interesting way to do mechanical design. You know, that it's not a blank paper that they don't get to design something from scratch and then, and then machine or, or, you know, 
Yeah. After they warmed up to the idea, it was like, oh, well, okay. And and looking at the bearings, it it initially it was well, okay. So how much resolution do you have to have? And uh, you know, looking at like, is this a, an achievable uh, set of specifications? And um, interestingly, one mechanical engineer said, nah, you don't want to use automotive bearings. And the other one went, wow, this far exceeds you know, the specifications oh, that you have for, but, but so, so, so we got like Why the first, you, well, if, uh, if, if, if I mean, if it's not, if there's too much slop in the, in the bearings and, and yeah. it's not going to meet your needs, yeah. then, then it's you a no go. Right. But so one, one mechanical engineer said yes. And the other said, absolutely. Wow. This is a great idea. And so that's where we are today yeah. is with two very different sets of feedback from the initial review. Uh, and, so we need to I'm repeat that. I'm not a mechanical that. engineer. I, right. I, I'm a, yeah. I'm a basher, right? Um, now, this is covered, the, the repo, which um, the link was posted in chat, the repo contains uh, sort of seed documents for the overview of the mechanical designer to try to lay out these principles. And um, we take pull requests. It's yeah. The, <laughs> it's the strongest way I can put it. If you have opinions, um, yeah. that are backed by engineering knowledge, then we're happy to do that. There's also a specification that is uh, in, in process, but coming along nicely for what the actual requirements are. I have no shortage of opinions, whether they're any good or not. That's you know, for someone else to decide. I well, guess. I have opinions too, and I decide whether they get merged into the repo. So <laughs> it's, all, it's all good. Um, yeah, we really want to know where we're wrong. I think that's the, yeah. to me, that's the highest priority is like, what have we got physically wrong? And, oh, exactly. you know. And the thing that you said about the engineers saying, well, these these bearings and these, what, what you're picking are way exceed your specifications. So if they cost 10 bucks. No, I that mean, was, that, I'm not saying that that was bad. That was like, wow, oh, that was, okay. and by the way, that's it's not, cheap. Like they're like, yeah. you've, you've, you've right. quota busted here. You've, you've gone way past what's commercially available. Uh, and, but, you know, but having said that, that, that one engineer was like, wow, this is great. And the other one was like, nah, this will never work. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's where we're at that's, with, that's with the, just a challenge when you yeah. say it'll never, yeah. <laughs> right. You know, so I think that it's time to, to go ahead. I mean, I'm in favor of building some of this. I think uh, that building, building it prototypes. and yeah. seeing we, if it lasts and, and, and all of that, that to me, that's the next step i'm i'm firmly biased in the uh we'll get it working over the air as quickly as possible you know uh making a prototype or clapping the stuff together um so so that's that's kind of my uh point of view and and i'm i'm ready uh ready to write checks or with a credit card to what i don't know what we need to get next i don't know what when we need people, to do when people have things that they have built and they're functional and they want to test them we have ORI has not at our immediate disposal, but we have a number of 1.2 meter dishes that uh, we can ship people to start actual. So, use. so how, how heavy is a 1.2 meter dish, and what are the what do the attachment points look like? I oh, they're pretty standard. I mean, we have the data sheet for the dishes. They were a very nice donation, so we have upwards of 30 of these ready oh. to go to to put together on stations and and send out. You know, so that's a, a, a nice asset to have, uh, but they're pretty standard. They're, the, the data, they're nice. The data sheets are in the repo, by the way. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I think we were still looking the for the mass, actually. though, because Jay pointed out that, like, they didn't yeah. have the mass, you know, the the weight of the dish. And I, I actually wrote back and forth with the um, the tech support from the company who was who insisted that the information was in on their website. I don't think I ever actually got an answer. So I think what we're going to have to do is ask our volunteer who has them in storage to go <laughs> weigh them. Where, where are <laughs> they, they Oh, uh, Illinois. Where in Illinois? Chicago or Southern Illinois? It's outside of Chicago. West, west yeah, of Chicago. West of Chicago. They, and then we're going to move them to uh, the remote lab that's being set up in Arkansas. So remote lab south is where they'll eventually B, you know, because the, the volunteer has been very generous in storing 30 1.2 meter dishes for us. Yeah, and in addition yeah. to that, we have three six foot dishes, 
you know, are essentially two major dishes uh, that will also get set up as an antenna farm for uh, all sorts of uh, citizen science, uh, open access uh, oh, dishes. How many, how many dishes would fit in the back of a pickup truck? That's a good. That's a good question. He said, you can... he said all of the dishes will fit in a, a, like an eighteen foot flat trailer. Yeah. The other thing is that those dishes have one, um, one, one. There's only one arm for them to uh, support the LNA or antenna at the uh, focal point, but we can use that as a model to manufacture all the rest that we need. And I've already committed, along with the the person at the southern lab headquarters to to go ahead and figure out that out and get those cranked out it's probably as simple as making a template and bending some conduit mm. usually <laughs> yes we can hope yeah That's, i think it'll work no out <laughs> so jay what are you what are your thoughts at this point i'd like to see the specs get finalized and have people take a look at them and see if the darts, because I threw a bunch of darts at the wall, <laughs> kind of going off of uh, you know what's available out there commercially. And I don't know yeah. if the darts that I threw are appropriate or if they're uh, uh, you know unreasonable. Uh, I've been reviewing them and they look good to me, but again, I'm not I'm not as much of an expert as people I'd like to have review it. Yeah, and I guess I, I fall into the same category. You know, I know what what gut feels okay to me but uh, you know when it gets into things like uh you know have, there's nothing for rotational torque braking torque because i'm not a mechanical engineer either um and i'd really like to have some a mechanical person say oh well if you're going to spin a mass that's this big you need x for braking and exactly i, yeah, I want to see um, that i mean they could probably figure it out but uh, uh, me learning how to figure it out is not as good as someone that knows what they're doing exactly yeah because we once we know the mass that we're moving and and the, some basic mechanical aspects, we can start to work that out. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. we if we do, it's like like doing an electrical design and figuring out you need a five thousand watt resistor, right? Um, right. <laughs> it, it may turn out that we need a thirty horsepower motor to do what we want to do, and that's not going <laughs> no, to be years. So, you need years. Uh, right. Yeah. So, Is there a yeah, spec that, for that how fast it? Traverse the uh, 360 degree rotation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a uh, darts in the spec. So if if you go to the GitHub um, and then I'm there and under I, docs, I'm flailing. And hardware. Okay, under docs. Okay, so under this docs data sheets. and then the hardware. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Uh, Hardware.md. Yeah. Yeah. Maximum load 50 kilograms. Okay. And you know what? I think that that. I did that based on I have a I have a like 0.9 meter dish and I went out with my luggage weight scale and I weighed it and it came in at like I forget what exactly it was it was like it was under 25 pounds it was I think it was probably 12 pounds or something and so then I said well if we're doing a two meter then I'll just make it 50 kilograms as a target but I think vertical load um, from some of the other specs I've seen on rotors vertical load is not usually the limiting problem uh, because you're just on bearings and it I've seen specs for like even the Yezu, I think, can take hundreds of pounds, no problem. Yeah, this sounds so similar to like be... when you have to calculate wind load, you yes. know, and you're it's yeah. you're looking at numbers you can... and you're like, really, that tiny antenna can can you know can create this much? Yeah, yeah. it sounds it sounds like it's a similar. Yeah. yeah, ice loading is another good example. Right. But then when you're using automotive grade parts, they're rated for you know tons of force. Some of them, even even if you use a pipe with two conical bearings and mount the dish on top then you get the sideways the torque wind load it's still not very much compared to like the cornering that the wheel gets on a car well yeah but all that means is that's not the part that'll break <laughs> <laughs> i think that's we all know about, about that <laughs> yeah, I don't want that part to break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no it's a, it's, that was kind of our hope is by you know saying okay what's commonly available that we have a background in and i'm like well why don't you know, they're talking about bearings and, and the failure of rotors and the stories of all my friends who have like, ah, I'm on my third Yesu rotor, you know, in a couple of years. And, oh, why is this the weak link? You know, what? Yeah. It, it, it didn't make I sense heard, to me with that. an automotive background, but it's like, okay, it may not be. And we need to have this reviewed. Like, 
buy and we need more eyeballs and and do the full open source treatment on it but you know that's that's one of the the things that we're saying is like okay we can address this part that's been a, a, a weak link in the chain in the past and then okay what's the next thing that breaks yeah but i stories of people with big rotors are endless with rotor failures i mean that's just mm -hmm. and there's well, another was... thing that like steve conklin found um some really amazing uh portable or mobile deployable dishes where it's not up on a on a on a mast and you know turning and as l the traditional as l rotor it's down on the ground and it's a sort of a, a i don't know a stator almost like a push pull doodad and the whole thing um is in a, in a frame and I, I know i'm not being very super clear here, like you, chain driven or something or no it wasn't it was neat it was um uh, more like lever action uh it, and then it turns out uh, somebody in the San Diego microwave group built one of these linear actuators. Yeah, it's like a linear actuator that is that is making an entire frame lift up, and it's it's sitting on the ground. So this is one of those things that you buy if I guess you're, you know, a spy. I don't know. You know, so you're going out and you have your briefcase and you you fold it out on the ground and and it, there is still some moving parts. And then going beyond that to, to some of the other products that, that have been available or, or been floated before is a phased array that you literally just throw on the ground. And you, 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 you open your briefcase and you, you fling out your phased array antenna and that's it. It's just a phased array that lays on the ground and all of the smarts and all of the expense is then in this electrically steerable doodad. So it, has anybody done any research into the steering the vertical angle of antennas. I mean, tons of people have wrote four verticals and they can electronically phase them to for azimuth. Mm -hmm. But has anybody done any research in the vertical phasing of antennas? Yeah, you, you can see so some. I can tune my takeoff angle for. You can see it scattered around in some IEEE journals and papers. So, so yes, uh, I don't know of any affordable prototypes or affordable products in that category. It's all stuff that's ex okay. very expensive, but you know the basic math is accessible to us, and you know if we back up and approach it in an open source, sort of pragmatic yeah. maker fashion, I think we well, have a decent chance of coming up with solutions that would be, um, you know, not out of out of range of what we're talking about in terms of price. We don't know yet whether the I mean we. Each individual user might use this for UHF, BHF, LEO, or they might use it for moon bounce, or they might use it for nickel and dime, five and ten gigahertz. I, I don't think I don't think we want to sort of meld requirements for the pointing system with the actual antenna steering. Although we have talked about hybrid systems for for LEO, where you you do your fine steering with with an array. Um, for something in a lunar or orbit, but that's that. I feel like that's really out of scope for this project. Okay, because I was just saying is everybody seems to try to do a precision uh, yeah. design, and you don't have to do that. All you need to do is tune for a peak. Okay, so I mean, it, it, yeah, uh, what the lengths are is irrelevant as long yeah. as they or line you, up. To or peak. Scotty, would you say it's fair that you could probably calibrate this stuff out with modern computing? You know, embedded you, computing could do yeah. it. Yeah, you could do it. But then the question becomes, is that more cost effective than doing a mechanical steering arrangement? Right. In general, it's always been assumed that like these electrically steerable antennas are hugely expensive. It's that's just that's what I keep hearing. But like I think okay, so let's let's take that for the future and see if yeah. we have yeah. an opportunity here. Yeah, so if you make it mechanically steerable, then you could bolt any old antenna you want on there and you can use it. If you make it electrically steerable, now you got it design it into the antenna. Like I think that's what you were saying, Steve. Now it becomes yeah. part of the antenna design and that's not what you want. Yeah, but I, I mean this is a great idea. I'm happy to just keep brainstorming here, but we have a limited um with a steerable array, unless it's just freaking huge, you've got a sort of limited steerable um sweep and so you're you're not going to get horizon to horizon coverage uh unless you have a gross pointing 
mechanism and then a fine steering. And uh, these are all great, fun things to talk about. Um, it just feels like kind of getting into boiling the ocean territory. Here. <laughs> <laughs> we love well, boiling the ocean, great. though. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what, spe what specifications are... Specific. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jay. Oh, sorry, I was just saying it's very frequency specific once you yeah. deviate from the mechanical methods and it becomes less attractive to a, the, the wider audience. It becomes a very niche, niche audience, yes. um, you know, depending on what frequencies you pick. Oh, that's a very good point. I, I admit to not really being as appreciative of that as I should be. So there what, are also what... a lot more people with the skills to go, I, can, I, I think I can build this mechanical thing than uh, an electrically steered antenna system, which you know, for a lot of hams, at best, if they're interested in getting into that, what they could do is buy the kits and assemble them. Um, oh, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, I do. I have a something that that I've that's occurred to me with the with the experience of iterating through this effort over the past year or so is that we have a very strong tradition of open source in software, software design arguably is where the open source movement and open source licenses began. And there's a large amount of, of experience and a sort of a, a cultural recognition of it. When you start moving out to hardware, electrical hardware, electronic hardware, then you get, there's still some, uh, I think Scotty can probably attest because he has a front, front row seat to this at Tapper over many years of open source hardware design and also working on licenses. And then you get out to mechanical design and it's even less. So all the mechanical engineers that I talk to, the mechanical uh, people from, from the Burning Man, DEF CON, you know, and, and commercial. So w when we get out to this area, there's not a strong tradition of open source involvement or, or open source work. So, I mean, are we, are we looking at like, should we, should we step back from ambition and like, uh, scale things back, or or should we just accept the fact that we might need to contract out and pay people to do the evaluation that we're talking about doing? Like in software design, we could pull off and have and frequently do pull off design reviews for software in the open source community. And like you mentioned, pull requests, but like to um, to the mechanical engineers that I've talked to, they have no idea what a pull request means. They have no idea what uh, what you do for open source involvement. What do we need to do in order to make this design happen, given that the the tradition of open source involvement in the mechanical engineering world is not anywhere close to what it is in software. One well, within the realm of mechanical engineers that don't understand open source, they certainly understand if we're going to pay somebody or whether they're a volunteer, go and do this thing and provide a set of prints that can be used to build it, and then it would be up to us if we hired them to decide whether to open that design or not. And of course we would. So hiring somebody is not necessarily a blocker at all. As long as we have, in my mind, as long as we have a set of specs and the ability to test the design and iterate on it so that we don't just get a piece of paper from them that sits on a shelf for a year. Right. <laughs> Do we, what specs are we missing? Well, we have no specs for what the drive might look like. I think that whoever designs it is gonna to have to talk with, or have enough understanding that, to know that motors have to go on it to move it, right? Um, right, so the spec I'm looking at, I mean, it has slots for rotational and braking torque, but no numbers. Right. right. So you, you're saying we have to fill those numbers in, right? Before you can, before the mechanical engine Hey, do you meet the spec or not? You have to have a number for the torque that you that you need. Maybe the next step is to have the mechanical engineer tell us what those numbers should be. So if we say we've got a, a 1.2 meter dish, it's this high, it's this big, it weighs 50 pounds or 50, uh, 100 pounds, how much torque do we need to get our azimuth to, because what's going to happen is I see it says six degrees per second. 
but that includes startup time and breaking time. So that's going to depend on the mass of the thing that you're trying to turn and the size of your motor and the size of your gears, right? And then once you get all that put in, getting like hitting your target and staying on target becomes a control systems problem. And I'm much more familiar with the control systems aspects than I am yeah. the, the actual mechanical aspects. But it's still an issue, right? I, depending on how much mass you have, sometimes you just can't get there from here. Right. And one of the things that we learned on the personal space weather station is that it's really easy to ask for something, but it's but but that doesn't tell you how important that thing you're asking for is. So if you say six degrees per second, well, suppose the mechanical guy says, well, you need a 25 horsepower motor to do that, but you could get three degrees per second with a three horsepower motor. Or I mean, something along those lines. You could say, well, okay, maybe six isn't really that important if it's going to cost us a fortune. So let's get. And, and so what we did on the weather station, we said, okay. For the dollar figure that you have as a target, this is what you can get. Is that worth it or not? Is it is it useful or not? If it's not acceptable, then you got to go some other direction. But if it, it is it, acceptable, so I'm sorry, that, that, then maybe it's okay, and and you make this the compromise, right. right? Or maybe that's the cost. That's the upgrade option. That's the cost difference, right? That you you need mechanically if it's all the same, and you can buy speed by buying a bigger motor and tuning the control system differently, then that's okay. If you if you need that ability, you pay for that ability, right? Especially if you over-design the mechanical support because it's cheap, because you could buy $5 bearings, and then that'll support a 1 horsepower or a 5 horsepower or a 10 horsepower motor. You pay for the how much horsepower you want. All the other stuff remains the same because it handles any of them. Right be outstanding if if that would work out that way yeah how you know one of the things we could do which we've done before we did it for some orbital calculations that we need is we 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 hit i have a pretty good network of nasa and nasa contractor people and i could just put out a call for volunteers and some of those guys are mechanical guys and i'll bet they're i'm sorry uh Michelle, that all the ones that I know are actually guys, but I do, <laughs> I do know, a, I do happen to know a really excellent antenna engineer as a woman as well. And uh, maybe, maybe we can find some contacts to do some engineering review and, and even some of the mechanical designs for us for free or um well maybe it's time to you know I, I know times are a little tricky now but it sounds like yeah. something that might might could be a in-person event in the autumn you know that would we be sweet, fun or sweeten the deal by making it a party you know gosh i don't know what other excuse might we have to have an antenna party <laughs> yeah, <somewhere>? exactly <laughs> um, it sounds like fun i think i think we should should plow through and and see what we can okay. accomplish let, let me start shaking the tree and and you can too i know you have contacts and generally as long as uh, the rules kind of are as long as this doesn't conflict with anything that nasa is doing and as long as we don't claim that these people are like and NASA is endorsing our project or right. whatever, and we just yeah. name them as, as individuals, then there's not a conflict. And, right. Um, okay. And I know that between the missile people here in town and, and the NASA people, we know we probably have a second or third order contact that knows exactly the kind of stuff that we're looking for. Yeah. Okay. No, that sounds like a good idea. I think we're, I think we're able to field that sort of event and it'd be enjoyable. A lot okay. of good things would come out of it. So That's let's see. Really cool. I could, I could take one of my old Volkswagen uh, transmissions, use the flywheel and a starter motor and, mm -hmm. hmm, yep. uh, and a big battery, unfortunately. Flip the Just bug like, over on its back. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I, guess I saw plans for you to convert a Volkswagen engine into a 125 CFM compressor. Yeah. By taking one of the cylinder head, cylinder, uh, the valve covers off, redoing two of the cylinders to make them the compressor, and running two cylinders for the motor. And I'm just going like, wow, now who thought of that? Yeah. What a cool idea. I saw a sandblaster compressor that was a V8 that was done with one half of the engine as the compressor. One motor and one compressor. Yeah. 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 Um, on a similar note there. 
I have a question. I think Michelle, maybe you can help out with this one. Um, if we want to hunt down parts like that are common for, say, the Toyota Corolla, what's a what's a good resource to do that with? Is there like a Toyota Corolla parts book with the part numbers in it somewhere that I don't know what it would be called? I've never yes, done a lot of car work. There, there are. There's a cross reference for for auto parts. So uh, what? And so the answer is yes. The information is there, and uh, we have people that can can help with that it's a little tricky sometimes you can find this this stuff on the on the internet um you know but the cross-reference books you you, you wander into uh, a friendly shop or 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 what have you and and you can get the information uh and toyota themselves actually might be very interested in helping uh support this uh direct from the essentially direct from the manufacturer uh they've done similar things for this in um in amateur auto racing um so i'm I was just like, well, I mean, we just use the same sort of, sort of, you know, part service that you get when when you're putting together projects for for racing. Um, and then in terms of like actually getting the parts, um, what what we've done here for for maker and burner projects is just go to the U Pull It Auto shop, uh, Auto Yards. You know, it, it, one's named Econo out here, and it's this gigantic field of you know, as long as you're willing to go out there and pull the parts yourself. And as long as you can carry them out, then then there you go. They're 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 yours for a very cheap price. So, in terms of getting parts for for prototypes, worst case, you know, some of us have to go to you pull it auto yards and and go find the the car and and yank some parts out. Um, and and then in terms of like what well, the the cross reference for like which cars have what, um, that's a, that's equivalent roughly equivalent to good components engineering in electronics you know what what parts are are really truly available are going to be available meet your need over this spanning set of requirements uh, and that exists in in automotive as well so if automotive really is a good path forward for cheap easy get it together uh you know making this an accessible and and manufacturable makerable design um, you know, I'd, that'd be a big win. So how, how much are you willing to leave up to the builder to customize himself rather than say, here's the plans, go buy part number one, two, three, four, mm -hmm. five. The problem is the part number one, two, three, four, five might cost you 50 bucks and it might cost me 200 because, but if I change the part number to two, three, four, five, six, it might work just as well, but be I a think... little different configuration, right? I think we produce a reference design that's that's guaranteed to work as built with a set of reference parts, just like you you get a a, a development board from Intel. It has fixed parts on it. You build it, you know, you know that that works. If you build it exactly that way, you know it works. If you want to go off on your own and do part substitutions, then then that's fine and that's encouraged, but that's on you. Okay, so you could look at the plans and say, oh, they did it that way. I can make it work that way with these parts I've got over That's here. That's right. right. Or I bought these. I've got these parts in the corner, but the holes don't line up. I'll just yeah, just drill some more. Yeah. yeah. You I'm know. Thinking, I, although I'm, I'm not really a fan of drilling into brake drums because yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm bits, you know. Yeah. But, but, but the point <laughs> is, is there's standard brake drums that you can get that you could say, if you get a Toyota Corolla from – 75 to 95 yeah. uh -huh. any of those have the same wheel it's pattern exactly. that'll bolt up with our piece here yeah. yes with a four with like four m10 bolts or whatever they are right so or yeah. Yeah. Such, yeah. such right right because they get the studs on there yeah so and and the whole reason we keep coming back to automotive parts is because they're plentiful they're relatively cheap and they're there are millions and millions and millions of cars in the world even now. used ones are good enough for us Right. Yeah. We don't have to have new parts. Necessarily. No, I mean, I've repacked enough bearings in my life to know that you can, yeah. you can make it work, you know. Depends well, on a worn out brake drum. If we can drive it some way, you don't need the surface to be, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. That's kind of like the, 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 the sort of the, the like core idea here is like, okay, in, instead of requiring a specific manufactured part from this one, you know, retail outlet, that's the base of the design um, that we, we go with something that's plentiful and, and available globally, you know, that no matter which continent you're on, uh, there's going to be cars 
and uh, you know we take advantage of of something that is widely at, <laughs> manufactured and already yeah. engineered within an inch of its life for for a service that's much more demanding than what we're asking. This is kind of the uh, this is a complementary and opposite sort of approach to Satnogs, where well, if you have a 3D printer and skills in you know, a computer and, and enough money, you can you can make uh, you know this amazing open source. Uh, but, rotor that let that dis- distribute out to this distributed receiver network out there, you know. So our our goal is like the design is compatible with that. So we're adding to their network, um, but not competing on the higher end of the maker. Well, this isn't designed for a hundred pound dish, right? So it's... that's true. Th- they have been surprisingly durable. So uh, frequently asked questions of of, of Satnogs is, well, gosh, you know, it's three D printed. Does it even last a year? And there's yeah, been that's... there's been Satnog stations that have been up for years outdoors with 3D so printed one... parts mm-hmm. and you know if you use ABS and yeah, let's it's... put one up in Phoenix and see how it lasts in 140 degree heat. Yeah, you'd have to use higher end filament. Uh, you're not mm-hmm. going to get away with some of the but stuff that that bends. Have, you know, we have no ice. That's true. No You've ice. got no ice. So, yeah, you know. So there's been Satnog stations that have survived some bad storms, high winds. Yeah. Uh, brutal conditions, you know, I mean, and it's like, well, you, but you just make another one, you know, so (laughs) you just keep printing, you know, and you have it in stock and you just keep going. And it's, you know, the design is, you know, last time I, last time I did any printing for Satnox was version three and it's, it's progressed beyond that, you know, so this is one of those things that attracts this entire huge swath of makers with 3d printers, you know, that are, that, that have the, and, and also lightweight antennas. It is, it's lighter weight than what we're talking about. But they really want to move up in frequency. And then you move up in frequency, you start talking about dishes. And if you start talking about dishes and you start talking about extra weight and pointing and, you know, we, all of the stuff follows along. There's a huge amount of baggage yeah. from, from this. And that's what we're trying to grapple with yeah. while also to... being able to integrate back with Satnox. We and, want and the to... commercial options are, are they, they run a spectrum from, cheap and terrible to outrageously expensive for what they are. And that's because I don't think they're selling too many of them. It's a, there's a name for that problem. They're yeah. priced so high that they're not selling too many of them. So there's no mass production. Right. Like the what, what about for, uh, commercial dish uh, aiming gear. Is that too expensive? You know, like, like a home satellite station. Well, that's a very tiny, if you're looking at DSS, you can just, um, just you can go for Dish Network Tailgater, and it's a tiny little piece of crap with a like a 13-inch dish. It's not suitable oh, okay. at all. I think like SPID is what the high-end dish people generally yeah, use, yeah. and that's what we're probably going to. Well, that's what's already in the grant application for um, for the antenna farm in Arkansas for the six-foot dishes for citizen oh, science that? and, and, you know, so six foot dishes that are publicly accessible over the internet, you know, that here you go, here's, here's additional capacity for a larger, uh, getting into larger dish size. I know six foot doesn't sound like a lot, but it's, it's something that is hard for an individual to field. And it adds to the, the capacity that we have in the, the amateur core, you know, technical core. Uh, right. And that's the SPID is the rotor to get. That's just the, the one choice. Yeah, that's the thing that you get. Like that's that's what you end up getting for this. For this Nine hundred bucks for right. Yeah, and that's bucks. like a minimum. It starts out at like you're going to spend about a thousand or more. You know, so we're we're talking, we're looking at like okay, in order to really do this right, it's at least three thousand dollars because we have these three dishes. Yeah. Um, you know, the, at the field day site I was at this last year. Uh, the, the guy collects more dishes than any place I've ever seen. He's got a 10 meter dish. Wow. Okay. It, that's a lot. <laughs> 10 meters. Like, is... you rip this off from the VLA. I mean, it's like, wow. Uh, it's like right outside his ham shack building. It's pointed up and it's a, it's a 10 meter dish all mounted in the ground. And now, now for control speak of, since we're talking about network stations and, and, um, you know, Satnox is built on that principle, and we want to extend that. There is a it, it's it's a simple matter of software. Once we get the control system going to convert one stream, and I've done this before. I've written these translators and ham. In fact, ham hamlib or hamlib, depending on how you pronounce it, 
has a bunch of different rotor interfaces and a common a yeah. common language that you can use to drive them. So I'm not I'm not too worried about that. Use like a Raspberry Pi or something. I mean, what some yeah, or even an Arduino. But it's yeah. very simple. It yeah. rotor rotor command structures are typically not very complicated. Um, I have in mind a new one that will do more things, but that's an entirely different <laughs> topic. Yeah, the rote control and Hamlib are yeah, they're they're battle tested, and uh, that's a I great place to, to start. I want to be able to send my rotor a TLE and have it just do just the rest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, can we go back on the cost? Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's important. The, I just want to know what, what's the, um, what are the expectations? Because, you know, like, Yezu, you can spend $750 and get something that, you know, might maybe it'll move a half meter dish, maybe it'll move a meter dish. I'm not sure. Um, so, like, you know, if you're in the $1,000 range, you, that you, we may end up that a thousand dollars is not an unreasonable price for the parts once you start adding motors and mm -hmm. other stuff in. So, so what's what is the feel of the expectation of, of where we're we're shooting for? I kind of wanted it to be free, you know. That was my <laughs> goal. Was like if you can scrounge up the auto parts, is it, which well, are... if your neighbor owns a Toyota Corolla, <laughs> then <laughs> okay now. <laughs> no, okay. I know that's well, a, that's a catalytic converter. And right, exactly. That. No, oh, that's a big problem right now. No, so I know that yeah. that's, uh, I'm being partially facetious, but like I'm starting like, okay, what is, because 750, you know, for, for some of these orders, a thousand up to 3000 for, and I'm yeah. like, I think we can do a whole lot better, but the, the unknown is what kind of motor um, do we, need and uh, as steve said early on like well leverage you know gearing uh is your friend um you know look you can you know so so these but then, are but this, these are the trade-offs right you 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 add torque you reduce speed yes it's like there are all these trade-offs and then what is the dish mount do we do we provide most of these rotors only provide that for you to turn basically turn a shaft and you mm -hmm. hang the antennas on it and you counterbalance them. Yes. And that's and, on you because we have no idea what dish you have. Right. But a dish, one method of, of doing a dish is to do a flat mount in the center of the dish, right. And count, mm -hmm. and you still counterweight, but it's a, it's a different mechanical structure. If you look at the, the way a lot of camera mounts look, are, are used, um, that's typically what they do. So the end of the, the back side of the dish ends up being offset from the the elevation rotational axis by you know i don't know eight inches if you if you get that all or six if you can get it all really tight yeah um and that is essential to whoever's going to do the mechanical evaluation of this knowing how you sure if you take a 200 pound dish and you say that's the dead weight where's the center of gravity of that well if that's if that's a foot off of the rotation and then you've got counterbalances that means you're hanging probably i don't know i'm just going to roughly say 400 pounds off of the thing now you got that much mass that you're you're moving around and I, yeah we kind of we are going to kind of have to sketch out and, and alternatives are fine But I guess we need to we need to try to advance the design a little bit more to know. Yeah, this is why we've punted done. on some of this stuff over the past year. This is exactly why, because it's like ah, it's wandering outside of what we know, and and because uh, we 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 did figure out that okay, say it's a three inch mast, just say it that's what yeah. it is, and that's that, and that covers an enormous quantity of commercial dishes that somebody might have. So the other alternative is that we specify exactly which dish we want. We just say that this is what you get. Well, we can also specify it's a three inch mast, but we want the swing. We want, we want to be able to swing something at 100, uh, 180 degrees within X, X number of centimeters of that or X number of inches of that mast. Um, and then it's up to you to, attach to that if you, if you what i'm getting at is you if you have a 
if you have a three inch mast and it's in the middle of a couple of brake drum assemblies, you're not going to be able to get anything within the diameter of that brake drum, right? You can't, you're limited in how close you can get it to the shaft. And that's going to be really important just for a matter of torque and, and how, how much you can lift. And I, I know these things. I, I got myself through mechanical engineering in school, but I'm not a mechanical engineer. And I, and I, feel like we need some deep conversations with someone who knows more about it. So maybe the next step is to start talking to the people that you have in your network and and I'll do whatever I can to make a meeting happen as soon as it's safe, as soon as we can meet in person. It sounds like an in-person like a symposium or something like that might be the right thing. Okay. And that we take this particular recording and we we put it out there and say show us where we're wrong. Come tell us where we're wrong. Please Please do, uh, and listen carefully. Um, and then, you know, based on those two things, you know, the feedback from essentially the open source community and from the rest of ORI, and then working through our network to try to put together an intentional meeting. At that point, once we are educated enough from these efforts that we should hire somebody and that, you know, we say, okay, now we need to need a design, review it, and then move forward might be a good plan. Yeah. And if putting this out there results in somebody stepping up and who's a subject matter expert, then um, it's a complete success. See, I think the, the thing that it, the, the more you know about what you want as the end product, the less it's going to cost you. Yeah. And the more likely you are to get somebody who will actually be able to do it. If you just say, well, I need a nozzle rotor and it's got to use a brake drum and a spindle, you're not going to I agree. But if you, say, if you say, okay, now take this Toyota brake drum and you take this Toyota spindle and these bearings, and then you got to have the dish mount is like this. We need to, the more you can specify it, the more they will be able to actually come up with something that might work. Yeah, yeah I agree. The other thing, we're not going to control costs until we can pare this down a little bit. If you, if if you don't come up with a good set of specs and a, and a bunch of guidance, then you end up designing a tank. <laughs> or or, or F22, yeah. right? If the, right. No, something that's been the bane of the existence at the company, in our company, is that the guy comes in the door and he says, Oh, I got this great idea. And of course, he thinks that his idea first is worth millions because it's the idea. I mean, that's what really counts, you know. Uh, you, you people that implement it, you're just the workers, right? Yeah, but I'm the designer. But, yeah, but the point is, he doesn't know how to do it. So here's an example. A guy came in and he wanted to make, he wanted to automate a handball court so that it would automatically score the game. Oh, cool. Okay. That sounds easy, right? No, well, not, it's, it, not if so it was easy. easy, everybody would be doing it on all the handball courts across the yeah. land. So that's his million dollar <laughs> idea. Now you peons go off and figure out how to do it. Well, I, mm. I go, well, you know, the decisions we make here and the designs that we put forth this is going to determine really whether you're going to be a success or a failure with this product. If we pick some screwball solution and go off down that road, you're going to spend a whole bunch of money. It's not going to work, and then it's going to fail, and you'll that, that'll be the end of it. But if we're really smart and we've happened to figure out something that will work, then it's going to be a success. It's going to cost you less money. But and so, so that piece right there, picking the the architecture if you will that's the valuable part mm -hmm. we could never get paid for that yeah. we get paid for building circuits yeah but to determine what the circuit is that you're going to build that nobody pays for that they want that for free yeah that's exactly right that's what we need to push past and and, nail. and, and i mean that's why we're having this discussion because yep. we don't know exactly what we want and i mean i'm just a newcomer here but you know, ah, I, you're selling yourself a lot short there, Scotty. Same problem we had. This is why the Personal Space Weather Station is two and a half years old, the project. And we're just now getting to hardware because it's like, this is what we should do. No, that's what we should do. No, what? Yeah, didn't no, know. it takes a lot of work to get oh. through that stage. Yeah. It, and yeah. so and so this is the valuable part of coming up with some genius idea that is going to be implementable. That's yeah. That will, yeah. All right. I think we got a good roadmap for the next little bit. The big unknown is like, when can we have a 
have like, this sort of meeting in person. I, to me, that's like the, the well, tricky part. Me, I, I would want to go get a brake drum and a spindle and all that. And just oh yeah, we did. I've got uh, I've got all that sort of stuff those? clapped together here. Yeah, we it works. You know, it looks cool and everything. It makes great art. You know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but that's you know, and it works. It's like okay, this is neat. And the you know, the, so the traditional sort of you know, you know the. There, there's vertical and the horizontal, you know, so you go this way and you go this way. Okay, that works great, you know, and then, but then Steve Conklin so found some drive? neat designs that's like it lays down. So you remove one of your, your problems, um, you know, so tilt, you have the tilt and thing, you know, and I just put like you know, whatever motor I had, you know, so it's literally just moving itself and it can barely do it because it's right. teeny little and, motors. And so what are, when we talk about constraints, does this need to mount on a mast or on the top of a tower, or can it right. take up can it take up forty feet square feet of, of <laughs> yard space? Right, um, and, right. And then our, and, one of our questions that we looked at was how loud can this be allowed to be? You I know, saw them in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Because it's the first thing, it's like, you know, I, well, you know, being in a, in a fairly tightly packed neighborhood, um, you really have to start worrying about how much, how loud is it? And especially with Satnog stations, that has been a recurring issue. So if you put your really? Satnog station in, in a regular suburban neighborhood, and it tends to be a little loud and it's running all night long. Your neighbors are going to come ask you what exactly is going on here, and that the three o'clock in the morning, your right outside their window is not great. So yeah. Satnogs does not; it just assumes that you're available twenty four seven, and it will schedule your station for tracking stuff all over the sky, you know. And a loud station can be loud, you know. So so that's a consideration that we uh, yeah. we've learned about, you know. Yeah. Um, when you're yeah. looking at like a, a nice big yard, uh, you know. A, what I would consider growing up to be a normal yard, like an acre or so, you can have a loud thing out there and nobody minds much, right? You know, or like where Steve lives or, you know, some of us have, have, have lived. That guy, that guy in Texas that built the uh, EME on yes. the railroad around his house. Yeah. So like, uh, I don't know what, some kind of uh, railroad track car and he, mm -hmm. and he rigged up an electric uh, starter motor from a car to actually run the thing around yep. the track. And I'm going yeah. like, wow, that's genius. Yeah, the, but, it's rotated yeah. with a with so, a, like a little cart. Right, it runs on a track. Yep. Right, around on a track, it. yeah. And, and Not everybody has a yard like that. If you do the lay flat option where you have a frame that sits on the yard and, and elevation is, is like a linear actuator mm -hmm. structure, you you have pretty much denied the possibility that people can easily lift this thing 10 or 15 feet off the ground, which for a lot of people in semi suburban settings gains them a lot more of sky view. Yes. And yeah. so, yeah, like here, like I don't have a whole lot of sky, so I have to put it way and I have a sloped yard, a very steep sloped backyard. And so I've cut out a platform at the top. So there's a terrace at the top. Yeah, right and that's next to the house, right? Same here. Yeah. yeah. So well, if you're, yeah, if you're flat, the, you know, if you live in flatlands, yeah. you know, here, I though, if I don't put roof, antennas right. up top side, then I have a tiny little view of the sky. Um, so, yes, the, 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 the thing that takes up lots and lots of square feet on the ground works for people that have the, the, the yard to, uh, to afford. So. Okay, so let's work on let's this work on good. networking let's... and work on meetings and I and and take another real hard whack at the at the documentation in the repo, right. and then see uh, meet soon again um, and see what see what we can see how we can move it forward and get past this phase of not knowing what we don't know. I do feel like we're making progress, and thanks to Jay for for digging in to the to the specs and actually asking good questions i that was uh kind of a kick in the pants of this yes project needed, very so. useful very appreciated cool okay um until, right. until next time <laughs>